Katie, welcome to the Femsplainers. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Well, we're sorry not to have you in person, which was the original plan. I know. But well, we've, we've just been raving about your book, though. So we've raved about your book. Everybody will have to buy it. I'm going to make a fuss on Twitter after this interview. Because I just loved it. Oh, thank you. It was you. so beautifully done. And thank the way you weave the lives of these authors, we all admire these powerful, formidable women. And what complicated and sometimes chaotic personal lives they had. And you too. You, you told your own story of your various adventures and it was so well done. How did you decide, when did you decide to do a book about complicated lives? <laughs> well, you've done several. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, it's a subject I've been dealing with for a while, but this idea, that paradox of, um, women who are sort of strong and powerful in public and then in their private lives, like weaker or more abject or somehow subjugated in various ways, that kind of paradox has been interesting to me for a long time. And it's sort of been floating in the back of my mind. And it kind of, it wasn't until I started this book um, that I, you know, a couple of years ago that I really took it on, but it's kind of been in the back of my mind for a long time. I always remember studying the life of Mary Wollstonecraft. And here's the, the first woman to really sort of make it into the philosophical canon and, and this creator of, of the women's movement. And yet she was madly in love with Gilbert Imley, this inappropriate, very handsome, but completely unreliable man who wouldn't marry her. And she, and she I think she tried attempted suicide. Uh, when he went off and married someone else. And I always thought it was an irony. And then you found that in so many other female authors, like Simone de Beauvoir with Sartre. What went on there? Well, she was really kind of central to my thinking about this book because her relationship with Sartre was so, um, well, she adored him. She called it at one point like one of her greatest accomplishments. Um, no, she did. She but, said it was her greatest. Experience. Yes, but and she really, um, but he also uh, wanted to have this open relationship and had all these other relationships um, with women. Sometimes she was involved with these women, and you know they both partook of this open relationship. But she really um, loved him and was more devoted to him. Yeah. I think than he was for her, right. and you know she'd write in these letters like, "I'm mutilated without you." And to me, it was really um, sort of jarring because she's such a brilliant, accomplished person. Yeah. And you know, she, at one point, her biographer said to her, "You know, what do you say to to the people who, you know, the feminists who think that your subjugation to Sartre and your personal life is at odds with your feminist theories?" And she said, "Well, I just don't give a damn. Um, I lived my life the way I wanted to, and it's too bad so many of them um, live so much in theory and not in real life." And that quote kind of intrigued me and it's at the center of this book somehow. It's like, what is that gap? Well, it's in many ways, I mean, I just came away from your book thinking like you are trying to tackle the central creative difference maybe between men and women. One of the first thoughts I had when finishing your book is, men don't write these kinds of books. And, mm -hmm. and so I was gonna say like, why, well, my question for you will be, why don't men write these kinds of books? But you quoted Rebecca West, which I think may get to the heart of it, which is, you say, I, or she was, she said, I would waste, I would waste on personal ends vitality that I should have conserved for my work. So, it, it's this perceived struggle that women, if they get involved, squander their creativity it, when they're in love with or in a relationship with someone in ways men men. Why do we obsess over it so much? Right, and well, and I I, I think. Um, some of the inequity, she, Rebecca West also has a quote when she says, since we love men so much more than they love us, that gives them much more spare vitality to be wonderful with, or spare energy to be wonderful with. And it is kind of that idea of our, why do we, sometimes, not everyone, and I, I had tried really hard not to generalize in this book, because I don't think it's true of all women, and I was really trying to stay away from like, all men are X, all women are X, because I don't, Think that's what it's about but I do see a lot of women who um, do have these kinds of contradictions in their lives and 
And um, one of the reasons why Rebecca West's essays were radical in 1916 and are radical now is that she was really talking about these really tricky, delicate contradictions that are very hard to acknowledge or admit. And, um, and I find them difficult to write about, you know, without generalizing, but really looking closely at my own life and how they work or at, you know, Edith Wharton's life and how it works. So I tried to look at really specific moments to kind of just delve into that question of like, what is going on? Yeah. And did you, did you find an answer? <laughs> Well, even in your own life? <laughs> I feel like, okay, so I don't, I feel like I did not find an answer. And kind of for me, I mean, you guys are familiar with my writing, but I'm usually someone who like makes an argument or I take a stand or I like sit, I kind of like come to conclusions in my work. I'm used to doing that. But in this book, I really deliberately didn't want to. Like I wanted to not, um, not tie things up neatly, not kind of, not make an argument because I, I felt like I really wanted to measure how does some of the kind of some of these things affect us in our lives like how can you measure how it's how these these forces are at work on an average Tuesday and so I well I don't feel like I came up with a solution like why to the answer to your question like why is why does so many women recognize themselves in these portraits but I did um find a little bit of peace with the contradictions. So I think at the, at the beginning of the book, I was still kind of trying to say, like, kind of bewildered by these ways I've behaved or these ways other women have behaved. And by the end of the book, I think I came to a little part of just maybe accepting. And Simone de Beauvoir has a nice quote. She talks about, she, she says, I, I wrote about women as they are, um, as human beings divided, not as they ought to be. And I think giving up that idea of like how, how we ought to be, like the, fem the feminist in me really wants to be like powerful in all aspects of life, but like maybe that's not who I am all the time. Well, I, I thought the ending of your book, and it's not really a spoiler alert because it's not like you're giving away a plot when you cite the end of your book, but there was, there was that sense of peace and wisdom and you have it, you end it with a scene um, where you're at a rented beach house somewhere and you're sitting there reading Sylvia Platt's <laughs> horrifying letters, you know, and distraught, pained uh, uh, letters to to her philandering ex-husband, I guess, at that point. And, um, and the, your kids are playing outside and your husband is, is cooking a, a lovely meal and you just, you, you sort of conveyed that even while there can be this turmoil, that to just have, find contentment in what you have and to, to sort of, I don't know, I just got this like, I'm really glad not to be Sylvia Plath right now. And I'm in a really yeah. nice That's moment. True. Okay, so I, since we are like just well, going for the ending, I, I think of the ending as like peace for now, like yeah. kind of like makeshift temporary, maybe like, not forever, but like here I am in a peaceful moment. Oh, also, when I wrote that scene, because I was thinking about, um, I don't know if you remember the scene in The Godfather where they're like in communion in church and then there are all these murders happening. Yeah. So it cuts from like the communion in the church to the murder. Uh, like, yeah. the church, the murder. And I was kind of thinking of that because I was thinking about these violent letters and the drama and the like pain. And, and the pain is really about being dependent on a man. Like, can she except that her life without this man and she can't fundamentally yeah. and that like just desperation and I, I just thought about cutting back and forth because the the cut is so like it just felt like um kind of a portrait of my life or or world in that moment and I, and I think coming to the end of the piece is just like yeah maybe I'm glad I'm not Sylvia Plath or like just like by chance, I'm not so like I just narrowly avoided like some things that here I am in this better place. But so I, I did feel like I ended on a note of peace, and that was kind of important for the book because I think other people, well, somebody once said to me, um, somebody recently said to me about the book, they said, like, it was really harrowing. Oh no, excruciating, they said. And it was kind of a compliment, but I was also like, I don't want to write a book that's just about these like painful, excruciating things that no one wants to think about. No, it wasn't. It wasn't excruciating. I mean, there were painful things, but it was also funny. 
And also, I, I mean, I, it, in some of the descriptions, I thought, well, maybe she's not, in, it, it, even the initial scene where, or an early scene where with your first husband, you are thrown out of a car and a baby, and it's just, I thought, well, maybe she's not a 100% reliable narrator. Maybe it was a more complicated situation. Because whenever there are these divorce stories, um, they're always harrowing. And there's, if you hear it from one party. So I figured that, and then it, it, it did turn out that he's, he's come through in many ways. He's, a, you know, maybe a better ex-husband than husband. But, and you show that uh, multifaceted personality. And there's so little of that in, in feminism that there's just this stultifying uh, oversimplification. And you, you sign a passage in um, Orwell where, I, I don't remember the exact words, but somehow people give in to slogans and they give in to cliches. And then these, these cliches take the place of thought. They, and it's words that do your thinking for you. Words that do your thinking for yes. you. Yes. And yes. you don't, in your book, that does not happen. And you just resist that. And I've read a few reviews where immediately, it's as if the thought police are pouncing and saying, oh, well, you know, why didn't she go here and go there? And they don't understand what you were doing. So it's very frustrating to me to well, see. I, I liked it because it wasn't so self, like a lot of these books and memoirs, um, especially by women, can be very, very self-absorbed. And, and the things, whereas you were sort of, you were almost clinical about yourself, which was really interesting. And philosophical. You always go to a right. level. And, right? Exactly. But in the end, when you came away from it, and you, you know, you are known as this strong, opinionated woman and get attacked a lot, and you, you know, and it's painful for you, which you, you know, talk about. But you did go hang out with a lot of abusive, I don't necessarily mean physically abusive, but emotionally abusive. Certainly that how your husband comes off uh, uh, to him and and so you sort of what's up with that like you mean like why what why to and you sort of rate you do raise this in the book of what was your attraction to yeah one of my sisters said I had a calamitous taste in men she was like but maybe one day you'll like meet someone good by accident yeah <laughs> and like I do think I do have I think you could say I have calamitous taste in men I'm definitely attracted to like very um, intelligent, complicated people mm -hmm. and maybe sort of like dangerous people in various ways. Um, and I am, uh, so I find like certain kind, and, and I often wonder like, you know, as you said, like, why did I get in this situation? And I tried to put that in the book that I, I have a line in something else I wrote where I say like, where a man has been monstrous, like every woman has a hand in creating her own monster. And I do really believe that, like these dynamics are about two people. But, um, but, but I think why I have, I can't really answer why I have that taste, but I, I guess what I wanted to do in this book is sort of um, look, at it, let, look at those kinds of choices from really different angles and not necessarily judging them. Like I've always been frustrated when people have been like, this is a healthy relationship, this is an unhealthy relationship. Like Sylvia Plath's relationship with Ted Hughes, unhealthy relationship. Simone de Beauvoir's relationship with Sarge, unhealthy relationship. Like healthy, unhealthy or judging things is less interesting than um, understanding them. So when you said like, I have a clinical view toward myself, like that was kind of what I was going for is like, just really analyzing like what is going on in this moment? Like, where am I? Why am I acting in these particular ways? And I think I, I, part of why I wanted to use my own life is because I don't think it's just me who gets into these situations or me who, who romanticizes a difficult man. I mean, I think that idea of like romanticizing suffering and love is kind of common or more common than it, you would think. Um, are there ma male writers? Um, I don't know. I'm thinking of the sorrows of young Werther, but that's not a good example. But just men that there are. I mean, there are, there are men that have been destroyed by relationships and make bad choices. But I just I'm not. I can't think right now at the top of my head. <laughs> well, they're uh, more yeah. like the unattainable woman. Um, I, I I I mean, again, here we are making generalizations, but. By the way, did you read Claire Tomlin's memoirs? Memoir? Oh, I did not. 
the biographer, she, she, it came out, I don't know, not that long ago. She's just this British... Uh, well, yeah, I know, I've biographer. read her biographies, yeah. And, and she has this great memoir. I didn't, and, and I didn't even think I wanted to read it, but then I was listening to the New York Times, you know, they have that uh, weekly podcast. The Daily Podcast. No, not the Daily. It's oh, the New okay. York, it's uh, uh, the book review. And they kept talking about it. And they didn't, they didn't really want to like it, but they all liked it. And I thought, oh, I got to read this. And she's this beautiful, brilliant little girl, just bookish and gets, finds her way into Cambridge University and then falls in love with Nicholas Tomlin, who's very charismatic president of the Harvard Union uh, the debate uh, group and uh, just handsome and irresistible. And she marries him and she wants to be a writer and all that, but somehow she has like five kids. And he is a pathological philanderer and unapologetic. I mean, he just goes off with a girl to Greece for four months. Then he'll come back and to apologize, he'll give her a beagle. And she takes him back. And her, and oh, I love but it her. It sealed it for me, obviously. The beagle, that's, that's pretty bad. But I read it, I was just so impressed with sort of, passive and but in, in but here she is this woman who just went in and sort of took over a, a, a man's world i mean she climbed to the top of the british literary world without any problem <laughs> but in her personal life perfect example and i had just read it so i recommend it, it oh interesting yeah. i should read that but but you you make a good point katie though about i often think that and i i won't generalize which sex does this but mistaking turmoil and um as as romance that that unless it's difficult unless you're in pain uh that somehow you're not having a romantic uh experience and 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 so sort of seeking out that type of man or a woman if you know uh, that yeah uh, it's it's a substitute and and in a way i think you had a point um where the, you you were talking about like the 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 chronic victims the chronic weak people actually have got a pretty some of them have a pretty good game going at controlling others around them by mm -hmm. being so helpless that you know they get everything to do everybody else to do things for them but there's something about that in this idea of romance that it's a way in some ways to be very self-absorbed you're always thinking about your reaction and what he did to me and 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 I don't know, I mean, I'm just a boring, conventionally married person who I, I, I find stability in stability. I find it's way nicer. Yeah. To well, and, married I, with and that's a very reasonable point of view. I mean, I feel like there is, I went back to Wuthering Heights in the book where I talked about, you know, like Heathcliff and that, that kind of idea of like drama and the lovers are like miser everybody's miserable and suffering and it's so romantic and i remember being like 12 and thinking this was so romantic and i went back and looked at the book and i to my horror i realized like he he literally hung a little dog that belonged to the woman who ends up marrying him and she marries him anyway and you know it it turns into that it's actually just like pure sadism and he's yeah. just really cruel and i had this romantic idea i had was just you know, and quite commonly, I think a lot of like bookish girls like that, love that book. But, but I do feel like there is a way in which not having somebody and always pursuing them and always feeling like you don't actually, they're not actually like with you. There's something um, appealing about that to certain people because of the drama and because of the like, the, just the lack of ordinariness the lack of settledness. Oh, a, a book that I loved was um, Christina Neering's book. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, what was it called? A Vindication of Love. Vindication of Love. I visited her uh, a few, several years ago in Paris after I mean, she had her little girl and she was living. Have you been in touch with her? I actually am. in. A, we've never met, but I'm in. A, I, we write to each other. So we, I'm, she's like a pen pal of mine. Yeah, she's my pen pal too. And I adore her, but that book did you read it Danielle? no no i didn't oh you have to tell our listeners just give a quick thumbnail what it is it's kind of a defense of dangerous love affairs and just how it, it, it 
it just takes you to a higher level of being and the passion and the drama and you come away from that. I don't know. It's like, it's like cutting yourself or something though. And I think. Who was it would say like falling in love is like giving someone a loaded gun and you, you know, they're. No, they're but that's, but I think that's, a, I think I, 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 I mean, obviously people feel that way and they do it, but it also, I do find it a sort of immature, self-absorbent. You, you were lucky. You met the love of your life when you were young and you married and, and now you're, you, she's has a, like a perfect marriage. And, it, no, but, that, but and that's only about 20% of marriages. No. Okay. Mar you no, know, but the point is how do you get to a happy marriage? And if you're always seeking that kind of drama, it, it, it kind of absolves you of responsibility too, that you never have to go through the day-to-day, -day, you know, ordinariness of, of learning to live with someone who is not you mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and appreciate them on, in, if, if it works, I think deeper and deeper and deeper levels that I think all the tumult is like a storm passing, but, you know, the storm ends and, You've got to you've got to live with it, and 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 that's why I mean, sure, if you want a, if you want your life to be in turmoil all the time, maybe that's a way to live, and it seems romantic, but I don't know. It's my own prejudice. I would just find it exhausting and and actually unproductive. I mean, one of the themes of your book, uh, Katie, is about I think this we were talking earlier about women fearing that should they fall in love and they're creative that, you know, the man will just unfailingly dominate them and they will give up their, they'll sort of ambition submit to dumb. Yeah. And submit to domesticity. And I don't know, I found in my case, uh, it was actually finding someone and, and having the storm, the storm calm that enabled me to, to actually write, um, much more than I think I would, or certainly when I was single, mm. along. Um, there's something also in favor of a settled life too, you know, that you can sort of put that sort of big decision to the side and now focus on, I, I don't know, it's, who knows, it's. <laughs> and that's, I'm curious about some themes in the book, like this bully who was in your department. So you're, you female bully, female bully. A female bully. Yeah. And it made me wonder if, I'm not sure of this, but I'll try it out. If we made a mistake. So we have all these laws and all raised consciousness about sexual harassment, which we should. However, maybe the real problem is bullies in the workplace or not. I mean, and so sexual harassment is one, that's one category. But what you had a colleague in your department, department. And you were coming up for tenure and she she was a sadist. I, I've never heard of anything. She would tell you like, go and photocopy these papers for me, just treating you like a servant. You were a colleague, you were an assistant professor, a junior professor, she was ordering you around. Then at your tenure review, she brought in every bad review. As I, as I heard that part, I, didn't, I, I wasn't sure if you'd gotten tenure or not. As I heard her, re, you know, the, this, reading off all these reviews, I thought, oh, I bet she got tenure because it was so, these were so vituperative and just <laughs> gossip. It was a gossip about, and I thought she's got to have some sane colleagues and, and I know you're a very fine scholar and teacher, so it just didn't make any sense, but my God. And there, we, I don't think we're uh, doing enough about bullies in the workplace. It's, I mean, we're doing a lot about harassers, which is good, but there are also bullies and they can be women. Yeah, and I guess one thing I wanted to bring up, this is sort of, in this book, I, I kind of stayed away from politics overtly, as you can tell, but like that point of like, the person who made my life most difficult in the workplace was a woman. And I do write about, um, one of the things I talk about in the book is like, we like the idea of powerful women, but we don't like powerful women themselves. And the idea of women competing with other women, which I think is very hard to talk about, um, and think about, but the idea of feeling like you have to pretend to be less powerful than you are, you have to, that there are women who are, and I do, I hear from other people too, that, that um, one kind of bullying that exists is women who are behaving competitively to other women. And I, and I feel like that, again, does not negate men sexually harassing women or male bullying and all kinds of things, but 
it coexists with it. And that, so, and I think you're right. Like how people abuse power is not, it's not just that men abuse power and women are powerless. It's that lots of people in power abuse power. And yeah. I, I feel like that kind of like de sort of genderizing it and looking at it more as, as that, as what you're saying is like, here, here's the way bullying works. But I also think the idea of expressing your, having to express your power in a way that humiliates somebody else, that, that just, it, it, it was interesting in this instance because it was a woman doing it, you know, and there was like really only what was in it for her was really just like expressing her power. Yeah, I, I, I would ne I mean, I could admit to all sorts of sins and foibles, but I never wanted to express my power by humi humiliating someone. You're a nice person, Christine. You're a normal person. I think no, I think, I think, well, I think as, as, as um, Katie points out, it, it, it gets complicated, but tell us about, speaking of power, you got really Twitter mobbed um, when uh, you were writing this essay for Harper's uh, about, uh, I think it was the shitty media men's list oh, yeah. that came out. We've talked about this on that program, but and it was a piece that said she was supporting the Me Too movement, but worried about due process and some excesses, and you know, it just a completely reasonable piece. News got out, and it, I, it's one of the few articles that was I've seen that was viciously attacked before it was. You know, yeah, it wasn't even public. So tell yeah. us, tell us about that, and and yeah, so it was it was quite a strange episode. Um, People thought it, I was writing kind of against this form of Twitter feminism and this like mob thinking. And then in a way what happened with the piece before it even came out and like advertisers were pulling their ads from Harper's and this big hysteria about the piece, it kind of illustrated exactly the phenomenon I was talking about. And, and I wrote, I called the piece The Other Whisper Network and it was just about how women didn't feel comfortable expressing these reservations that you just met, enumerated. You know, they didn't feel comfortable saying, well, maybe we should have thought more about Al Franken, or maybe this has gone a little too far. Or should we have give, you know, investigate something more fully or, you know, if so, like they were just people kind of, you know, who are skeptical about certain aspects of this movement and they just didn't feel like they could say that out loud. And so I collected, everyone set, spoke to me anonymously and I finally like made that into the point of the piece. It's like, why do we have to be so anonymous? you know, in expressing these pretty innocuous common sense things. And, um, and in the moment, people got very angry. And so there was really a very insane, huge Twitter response, which was exactly what I was writing about and the kind of like viciousness and, and kind of mindlessness of this way of thinking. Oh, and, well, I'm um, just going to give an example. There was this writer, Nicole Cliff. She, she tweeted, if you have a piece about to come out in Harper's, ask your editor if the Royce piece is happening. If it is, I will pay you cash oh, yeah. for what you, you lose by yanking it. Yeah. Here's a, a female writer, a woman writer, offering money to people to, to protest you. I've never seen anything like this. Right, and I mean, the piece also hadn't appeared and like they didn't know what was in it and they thought that I was naming someone. And you know what, even if you had named her, why, why, does, why does, what was Maura Donegan? Why does she deserve anonymity when she created a, a, a McCarthyist list on Twitter that named men? Some of them were probably guilty, but many of them were not. Yeah. And she, it, it was an anonymous informant. She puts this on, and you know, then she. I, I, yeah, and then I, I don't think that she was um, very private yeah. about this list, to be honest. But it in an event, the whole episode was kind of a false drama. It was like a false. Exactly. The things that they were upset about and people were upset that it was, it was really just a moment where criticizing or in any way expressing some sort of concern about this political moment was just really, you know, taboo. And I, I honestly felt it was very, it was kind of disturbing because it's so intense, but, um, but it also, your editor not. stood up for you, right? I mean, even yeah. under threats. Harper stood up for me. They like really yeah. defended yeah. the piece. They, you know, they definitely like stood behind the piece. And in the end, like, you know, they obviously like sold a lot of copies of that magazine because people read, more people read that like 5,000 word Harper piece. Everybody subscribed, Everybody yeah. subscribed but, Harper's because they've been brave throughout this, this period of where there's- Yeah, like, no, it's, I mean, and so it was fine. But it was an example of um, sort of the 
uh, the dangerousness of this kind of media bubble and the way people are, you know, it wasn't just some of the people doing really disturbing things on Twitter were like, there was an editor at Esquire who made a Halloween mask out of my face, cutting out the eyes. That was like really disturbing to look at, but that was like an editor at Esquire, you know, it wasn't like a cruel, person. Cruel, cruel, cruel. it was Russia. somebody with a respectable media job who thought it was really a good expression of his feminism to like mutilate a picture of a woman. Yeah. You know, so some of that stuff, or people were tweeting like "suck my dick, Katie Roy Fee." Like there was a lot of like violence to it. Yeah. In the name of protecting women, and the whole thing was so hypocritical. They also like those kind of people don't understand irony. So like they didn't understand the irony of like p attacking a woman, um, and what that means. And but it all together like it kind of. Um, kind of proves the point I was making in the piece and it was I got to put it into the piece because I had a little extra time so anyway it was it was that was a not fun episode well it was so not fun that what they really want to do is to discourage you and other women from writing and expressing some um uh, you know uh, just questioning and having a dissident opinion see they want to shut it down and that is so unhealthy for feminism. It's so unhealthy for any, for, you know, men and women it just to have all these forbidden topics and then this punishing little mob that comes after you. And, yeah. they, and they really hate you so much because you're, they, the people they hate most are those that are sort of on, should be on their side. So they sort of see you, you're on the left and you're, you know, you can't dismiss you, just ignore you as some crazy right winger. So they, they hate you even more. And I've seen them do this to Caitlin Flanagan, Laura Kipnis. Mm. Um, and yeah, do you have an, uh, something I've always wondered is why aren't there more women like you, like me, like Camille Polly or Kipnis, et cetera, I, I, I thought early on when I saw some of the excesses of a sort of strident, you know, sex phobic male uh, demonizing feminism, I thought there'll, there'll be a lot of academics, uh, women writers, women scholars that'll protest because this is just too ridiculous. And, you know, there haven't been that many. If you think about it, far more who have joined the, who are part of the, yeah. I mean, I think my, my, one of my things is just that if everybody says exactly the same thing, it's just also, aside from being unhealthy for our political discourse, it's also just boring. Like right. in Twitter, you just repeat endlessly the thing that everybody want, is supposed to say. And I think that, that one of the problems is fear, as you said, which is I, well, I'm lucky that I have a tenured position. So I felt like I could write that piece. I think if I was a freelance writer, and I know lots of freelance writers who do not feel like they could have written a piece like that because who's ever going to publish them again? And I, I really did have some dark moments in there where I was like, am I ever going to publish another word again? And I felt, I sort of thought to myself, well, you know, I have my teaching, which I love, so I'm okay. Like, I had the luxury of a position that I can feel like I can sometimes you know, sit in it. I mean, obviously, I haven't always had this position. I only just got tenure, but I, I do feel like I, I do have that luxury. And I think for a lot of people, and I know a lot of people who wanted to write things and just couldn't feel, didn't feel like it would ultimately be worth it for them. Um, and obviously there are people who do, you see like Barry Weiss or, you know, you see all kinds of people, but usually they have an institution. Right. Um, because otherwise it's a little like, you know, there, this force of conformity is very powerful. So, um, you know, I can understand a young writer or, uh, you know, somebody like some novelist, like just being a little careful. And I, that's I, very I, I, about it. That's, I, I, that's what it, I think find very ominous. I was gonna ask you, because this goes back to your first book too, is why do people have such a visceral reaction to you, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> I do not know, I don't know. Um, it's true that I think, um, they do. Like, I, I, I tried to write about it in this book, like, why I'm unlikable or different. Totally likable. Oh, and thank charming you. And, a, and, a, and an original, I mean, just a beautiful writer. It's just so sinister that someone like you would be a target of the program from the, 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 
junior, what is it, Orwell's junior sex league, anti, junior anti sex <laughs> league. <laughs> but I, but I do, you know, I think about one of the things I try to write about in this book is, is what is it, um, what am I doing that like arouses this hostility? And I, and I do think some of it does, I did try to kind of examine that question. I have a section where I talk about being relatable and women writers being yes. relatable. Yes. And your and, smile, like, why can't you smile? Oh, why can't you smile? And also the idea of like, I think showing weakness, like I, I don't generally, in this book is different, but like in most of my writing, I come across as kind of like tough or fierce or people are always saying to me, like, you're not like as scary as I thought you would be. And I think there's something in my writing where I put forward a self who's like a little more tough than I am or sort of um, fierce. And so I think that that idea that, and I think women do it all the time. Like if somebody says to you, you look great, you say, oh no, I have circles under eyes. Like you always have to say like, I'm not intimidating. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm like not that great. I'm not, I'm falling apart. I barely feeding my kid breakfast today. You know, so that idea of like saying, I call them I'm a mess moments. I think I haven't done that much in my life because I, it's just not the kind of writing that I do where I talk about my vulnerabilities. Kind of what you were saying, like I just, don't find like my vulnerabilities that interesting. I can think of other writers who find their like sadnesses more interesting. Or their rage. A lot of them like to write about their rage. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, I think, and I'm, I wonder sometimes, um, and you touch on this too in your book about it being different as a woman opinion writer or when you, when you, cause a lot of your writing has been on these sort of more political aspects of the sexes and then just taking a stand, not backing down, not using yourself as an example. I mean, you, there is this female impulse to always say, as you say, oh no, but I just, like we all have to, we're, there's something that we're always having to bring ourselves down um, and with other women. So it's a, it's a deeply female impulse for whatever reason. Um, and then when you don't do that, um, maybe it just disturbs people that you're not uh, as a woman willing to do that or or i think it's like i just i feel that yeah it's annoying or like grating or makes it just somehow like gets people angry when you don't do that when you don't offer up some sort of vulnerability or weakness right. or like something a as way to sort of mitigate the kind of pushiness of your taking this opinion and I, I try to talk about that in the book because I, I do, it's not that I don't want my readers to like me or I don't want to be a relatable writer. I just like, I'm only relatable to like a really small subset of people who I guess are kind of like me, you know, who, who might relate to this. But I feel like in general, I am not performing in the way that women writers usually perform to be relatable. And I kind of go through even somebody like Joan Didion, who's like tough as nails, will write about like, but then I was like crying in the Chinese laundry and crying when I walked down the street because I was so sad. And those kinds of moments where she writes in like, oh, I'm so neurotic. Oh, I'm so, you know, whatever. She tries to kind of say, I'm not this like threatening, you know, brilliant person. I'm just like you. And I, I, I just, I think that performance is something very, that our, that our culture is really, expecting of women writers and we, we sort of put it on women writers we want um them to say something that like you know diffuses the kind of like audacity of taking authority right it's more it therapeutic camille palio once pointed out that now we have a couple of generations of young women among the best educated in human history the most you know opportunity rich young women, and yet we are, we haven't really produced the kind of, we had these women writers that, you know, you look back in the 40s and 50s, and there were these towering female intellectuals, and I mean, Susan Sontag and into the 80s and 90s, but not just her, but, you know, Iris Murdoch and Mary McCarthy, and it's, it's and maybe it's true of men too, where maybe we're not producing these towering male intellectuals either, but where are they? Why haven't, with all of this education and empowerment, doesn't it seem like there's a dearth of female public intellectuals? 
I feel like there are um, some pretty impressive ones. I feel like somebody like Maggie Nelson. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's some pretty impressive ones, but I guess I, I think our culture doesn't um, kind of glamorize or celebrate a public intellectual anymore. Yeah, I just so like, said that. I thought public intellectual really now is like living in Bushwick in a like with four roommates, like publishing in a, a small periodical you haven't read. Yeah. It's a lot or, harder. Or, or it's Oprah. Yeah, it's a lot harder to like make, you know, it, it, when Mary McCarthy was writing, you could write book reviews for the New Republic and like support yourself. It just isn't like the same right. world, I don't think. Right. So it's I feel like it, that's the economics and that's the, economics. the values of our culture. I, I recently read a, this wonderful, it was sort of a biography of the 18th century, but particularly Samuel Johnson. And for, here he was one of the most brilliant creatures ever to live. But he, he was, it was always about money. He was desperate for money. And it was true of Balzac. I mean, there are many, many writers. And I think a lot of women writers, it's impossible. And then you, with the complications of children and difficult marriages, and just having the money to survive. Anyway, I wished that you had won a, you deserve to have won a, a MacArthur Fellowship. And, oh, well, thank you. And I'm hoping now with the tenure, you'll have the peace and the time and the ability because you're such a gifted writer and we need to hear more. I mean, oh, thank you. Really. But I know you had, you had to struggle. And then to, not only that, and then to have to struggle with this opprobrium because of your originality. That irritates me. It really does. It, it makes me mad. And I don't, I'm not given to rage. I'm not raging yeah. against you. Uh, you kind of are. We had to create a special feature called the rant. So you can have a rant <laughs> out of your system. I don't care anymore. I'm just going to drink and say what I think. But I think it's that people have gone mad and how they couldn't appreciate. Katie, they have, you, you could be uh, one of these public intellectuals, but you're pushed and you're battered and, you're, and they threaten and frighten you. And, but now just yeah. wait, you'll come, you'll come out. Ah, uh, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, Katie, it, it's been so wonderful to meet you, even at least virtually. Um, yeah. Followed you for a long time. And your book is The Power Notebooks. I can hold it up on video, which I can't normally do on our podcast. And, uh, uh, and thank, thank you, you and, so much. And, and good luck through come to Washington the whole and pandemic. Yeah. Well, one day we'll meet. One day we'll meet in person. One day we'll stop doing the Zoom meeting. If that happens again. I, God, it seems indefinite. It'll go on for longer than we think. I know. Uh, well, thank you so much. You're thank really you guys excited. so much.